Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where every Tuesday we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft. This episode of Your Average Witch is brought to you by Beyond the Sage. If you're like most witches, you love tea. Step into the mystical world of this witchcraft and tea e-shop where you'll find an array of divine offerings to nourish your mind, body, and spirit. Beyond the Sage offers a wide range of divination tools, spell candles, and unique gifts, all aimed at empowering your spiritual journey. In addition to their magical offerings, shop creator Danny is proud to offer homeopathic remedy options carefully crafted to support your health and well-being. Every product in the shop is made with organic, ethically sourced, or homegrown ingredients, ensuring that you receive only the finest quality goods. And to protect the environment, Danny is committed to upcycling, recycling, and avoiding plastics wherever possible. So if you're seeking lucid dreaming, healthy detoxification, trippy teas, safe weight loss, or unique spiritual tools and remedies, look no further. Visit the shop at their link tree at linktr.ee backslash beyond the sage. And let Danny guide you on your journey to enchantment and enlightenment. Embrace the magic and venture beyond the sage. Listeners of Your Average Witch can take 25% off your order of $25 or more using code Average Witch with no space in the middle. In this episode, I'm talking with Mahegan of Kitchen Toad. Mahegan is a blogger, a cunning person, and a folk witch. We talked about growing up woo, being an entrepreneur at a young age, and why witches need to be multilingual. I'm also excited to announce that Mahegan is starting their own podcast, and the first episode comes out tomorrow. Check out Sat Upon a Toadstool, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on Mahegan's website, kitchentoad.com. Now let's get to the stories. Mahegan, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Can you please introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Yes. My name is Mahegan St. Pierre. I run a small shop named Kitchen Toad. I'm mostly on Instagram, which is Instagram slash Kitchen Toad, uh, where I basically sell magical wares. I offer services. I do divination and spell work and consultations talismanic consecration, stuff like that. Um, and I also write on the Kitchen Toad blog and have a bunch of fun projects that are all witchcraft and occult and folk magic related. I am really excited to talk to you. And I know one of my friends is super excited that I'm talking to you. <laughs> when I told her I was talking to you this morning, she was like, yes! <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here. Me too. Can you please tell me what it means to you when you call yourself a witch? Yeah, um, this is something I talk about quite a bit. To me, witchcraft is about the relationship that we hold with the others, um, as in capital O, spirits and fae and land spirits and gods and whatever you want to call it. Um, and is really the process of mediating between those two realms and becoming somewhat othered through the process of relationship with spirit. I love the otherness part that nearly everybody says. I love that about us. <laughs> Would you say you have a family history with witchcraft or magical practice, even if your family does not use that term? Uh, a little bit. Uh, my family's very spiritual. Um, we're like good old Catholics, like pretty much everyone in Quebec, um, like culturally Catholic. But the more like time goes on and the more my grandfather tries to evangelize me, the more what he says sounds like spiritism and like, um, because, you know, he believes in God and angels and saints and all that. But he also believes in fairies and demons and that spirits of the dead can come back to haunt you. And, like, his worldview through Catholicism is very folksy. Um, and he's very much the one that kind of shaped my family's spiritual background. He's big into, like, the law of attraction and, like, the secret and, you know, all those fun things that came out in the 60s. Um, and my mom was very, very spiritual we're um half indigenous and so we i grew up with my mom um doing ceremonies and stuff like that because she's a reconstructionist um she's an archaeologist 
specializing in indigenous studies through a reconstruction-y kind of vibe. Like we basically had a whole like in the uh, Native American village in our backyard and did animation and stuff like that. So I grew up with a sweat lodge and a long house and all the fun stuff. Um, and then we've always been very, very woo woo. My mom was like a little bit into like crystals and gnomes and undines and like elemental spirits. Um, and I was very much taught growing up, like you pray to God, sure, but you also pray to the trees and to the rocks and to the rivers. And like, there's always something that can hear you. So the spiritual background is not defined as witchcraft per se, but it is very, uh, it was a very big part of my life growing up. Sounds very witch adjacent, at least. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you introduce us to your practice? Like anything that you do regularly that you'll share? Mm -hmm. um, my main focus within my craft is very much on land veneration. Um, and I do include like the celestial realm into the land because it's with a capital L. We're talking like spirits of what's around you and what you can see and what you can interact with. Um, I'm very big into ancestor veneration, whether that's my own bloodline or if it's mythic ancestors. Um, my family name is St. Pierre, which is St. Peter. And so I do venerate him in my practice um, through that lens. Um, venerating the local dead as well, the people that came before us and built the places that we inhabit and the infrastructure and the culture. Um, and otherwise, I do a lot of in herbalism. I actually got into magic proper through my kind of mix of herbalism and like spirituality growing up. Um, I've been my mother was always very granola and like crunchy. We always did like herbal remedies and homeopathic stuff. And then I started studying it when I was like, 11, 12 is when I started being very interested in it. Um, and that's what led me into witchcraft proper. So I have a big background in herbalism and holistic wellness and nutrition and all those kinds of things. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you say that witchcraft changed your life? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not really someone who got into it because... Um, it was interesting to me. Um, it was always like a thing that existed and I knew was an option and I knew was applicable to certain situations. And then I was forced into a corner essentially uh, where I was very powerless and desperate for something to change. And so that's how I got into the practice of everything. And it definitely had some very big impacts in the, at that time. And then that's kind of what got me rolling into it. And it, really allowed me to take back power within my life and take back agency and build on confidence and really develop my personality and like strap up a little bit for life. Um, because I feel like if you're going to go into the woods in the dark all alone to like conjure terrifying ineffable names and spirits, like you really got to be able to like walk the walk the walk and talk the talk in your daily life as well i'm not going to go confront something that i can't see and that can ruin my life and then also be afraid of my boss you know <laughs> <laughs> yes like those two are a little hard to do at the same time i think <laughs> what would you say is the biggest motivator in your practice and has it changed since you first started Definitely. Yeah, it's, um, it's changed quite a bit. Because initially, like I got into it really for um, the power in the agency and the ability to change my circumstances. Um, my background's a little rock and roll, a little roller coaster y. And so it really helped stabilize my life. And then once I kind of was able to um, settle down a little bit and calm down and, you know, recuperate from all the craziness. I started Kitchen Toad and um, now my focus is very much on building community and then serving the community um, and respecting the legacy of magical service workers through the ages and cunning folk and herbalists and pretty much anyone who had um, a part to play in their community's spiritual life and belief. Can you share how you decided on that name? Oh, eh. I feel like I've mentioned this before. It was supposed to be a food blog. 
<laughs> um, I moved to um, Vancouver when I was like a teenager and um, I was like really inspired by the market scene there. There's a beautiful market on Granville Island um, and they sell like local goods and vegetables and BC is wonderful because there's like produce year round. It's lovely. Um, and I'm big into food. And so I was very inspired by that. And I like threw myself into this crazy project where I was like, I'm going to buy a domain and I'm going to build a website and start a food blog and da 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 da. And then I didn't yep. do it. <laughs> and I was like stuck with this like $700 domain that I bought for like 10 years. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? And then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know, it's kind of catchy. It's kind of a good brand name. Uh, so when I started up the business, I was just like, well, we're just going to call it that. It doesn't really make any sense. But, you know, I like to think that maybe it does, I'm though. the in the kitchen, you know? It super <laughs> makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> Toads are super witchy. They are, yeah. It used to be, um, I was blogging under the Frogs Apothecary for a really long time. It was always frogs for me. It was never, like, toads. But then I was like, toad kind of sounds witchier and more, like, <laughs> I wish it I wish it was like some kind of like toads are super sacred to me and like da da da. But um no it was it was a business decision fully. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Want to try making edibles, but you're not sure where to start? Or you love to experiment in the kitchen, but you could use some inspiration. Join me, Marge, host of Bite Me, the show about edibles. I help cooks make great edibles at home. Each episode, I walk listeners through a cannabis edibles recipe that I've tested in my own kitchen. Or learn alongside me as I interview professional chefs, culinary cannabis experts, and edibles enthusiasts. Whether you're seasoned or just getting into edibles, there's always more to learn about making great edibles at home. Tune in for fun and informative episodes every Thursday on your favorite podcasting app or at bitemepodcast.com and stay high, friends. I really, that's kind of why my business name is what it is. Because yeah. I like the way sounds, <laughs> I like the way things sound when they come out of your mouth. That's why Clever Kim's Curios is what it is, because I just like mm. the sounds. <laughs> Good alliteration, yeah. Exactly. What would you say is your biggest struggle when it comes to your practice? For a long time, I think it was imposter syndrome. Um, I think that's everyone's story. Um, you know, when you're dealing with the invisible and like things that most of society is going to tell you isn't real or that you're like mentally ill or, you know, crazy or whatever. Um, it can get really annoying and really difficult to kind of parse through what is spirits and what is mental illness and what is stress and what is you know your own inner critic um and conscience and like all those things and differentiating between those things i'm someone who took a really long time to develop the um like the the psychic senses of like mediumship and being able to communicate with spirits more openly and differentiate between um, what was me and what was spirit and what was intuition and what was, you know, outside influence and stuff like that. Um, and so that was a very big struggle for me. I kind of just like kept powering through and then had like multiple crisis of faith, um, throughout the days. Uh, and then once I kind of settled into like a good routine of developing those skills and differentiating what was what and really, um, came into my own in my practice and stopped really going from system to system. I mean, I did everything. I went from like traditional witchcraft to hoodoo to chaos magic to Tantra Hecate stuff through like Jason Miller's course through uh, ceremonial magic, a bunch of stuff. Um, and never really found like settled onto a personal practice until maybe five years ago. Um, and then at that point, things kind of fell into place and i would say nowadays my biggest struggle is probably um balancing what is work and what is passion in my practice because when you when your spirituality is a business and is also in the public eye it can be uh yes <laughs> very tempting to sell out or to uh 
you know, if I wanted to one day, like I could totally turn around and start charging like $700 for a six week course that says very basic information and sells you a bunch of products, but I have too much integrity for that. And so I am always like, do I make a lot of money or do I stick to my guns and like be a good person? Um, and it's like navigating the whole business world is crazy, especially in this community where I think people are very, um, people are very cutthroat between what is business and what is friendship and what is magic and what is, uh, you know, community and what isn't community. And then everything gets very blurry, very fast. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult market for sure. I bet part of that is because we've been on the outside for so long that when we find community, even if we're paying for it, we latch on. <laughs> At least that's my mm. experience. Definitely. There's a, there's a lot of cult leaders hiding in plain sight. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you don't have so much of an issue with imposter syndrome anymore. When you did, how did you sort of pull yourself out of that? Delusion. Or did you? Oh, good. Me too. Straight up <laughs> just uh, pretending like <laughs> I didn't hear my little imposter voice uh and also well i do have like the very special position that like throughout my entire magical career i've been blogging i literally if you go back in the internet archives i'm not gonna get I'm not gonna tell y'all where to go because i don't want anyone finding <laughs> that but yeah, i have a very strong paper trace uh you can see like the very first spells that i've ever performed online um like, oh, that's terrifying to think of. <laughs> like, yeah, so everything that I've done... I don't want I've people done, to see all that. The, all the misinformation that I used to incorporate and all of the bad opinions that I used to have. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, yes. And photos of things that shouldn't have been taken. And anyways, you can find all of that. And so, <laughs> you know, I did get the chance that I've always had people to discuss online and also people to, like, get like kick my ass a little bit uh i think that like g having people in your community point out what you're doing wrong or what you're um spewing bullshit about can i swear on this podcast hell yes okay awesome um i cuss like a sailor <laughs> me too um perfect so yeah you know having people in your community that are older and more experienced that can really tell you like hey what you're saying is wrong um and you're kind of running your mouth for no reason um uh, maybe like look into that is really good and so that helped me because in my mind i was like if the, if i can be wrong about things that means there's certain ways to do things right so it can't all be false you know um so that helped a lot and then i've also always been providing services um i practiced for maybe like two three years without telling anyone and then after that i was um already like performing spells on behalf of friends and classmates and people in my life, family and stuff like that. And doing readings for folks um, because I had the chance to grow up in a very spiritual um, and very open-minded environment towards those things. Um, I mean, the witchcraft is still a little hard to swallow for my family, but they don't care about tarot and like tea leaf readings and stuff like that. Um, and so I've always had people like believe in what I do apart from myself. So that always carried me through. Um, but otherwise very much just delusion and being like, you know, I'm just going to tough it out. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing for a couple of months. And then if I still feel the same way, if I don't, you know, if nothing that I do succeeds and none of my spells work out, then I'll give up. And then it never happened. So test of time. That that idea that okay this is what i'm doing wrong but that means there's something i can learn that is right holy shit <laughs> that's great mm -hmm. it's kind of it's a little backwards but it really it made a lot of sense to me <laughs> it makes sense to me like epiphany type good lord what brings you the most <laughs> joy in your practice <laughs> uh Nowadays, I would say it's probably, like, the relationship I've developed with my spirits. Um, I've always considered my spirits to be my family. Um, 
I kind of consider that they raised me a little bit. Um, just because I left home really, really early, um, and was on my own very early on and, um, really struggled with, uh, family things and cut everyone off for a couple of years and all that fun runaway stuff. Um, so my spirits really took a familial role for me and really carried me through a lot of things. Um, and the same, I get, imagine in the same way that a lot of people's like faith for God carries them through a lot of things. Um, my spirits have always been very present and vocal. Um, once I started being able to let them in and communicate with them more openly and receive, like accept what they were saying. Cause they've always been talking. I feel like that's something that a lot of folks experience where like, everyone's always wondering like, how do they hear their spirits? And they already hear them, but they can't really, they either don't allow them in or they don't, they like push aside what they're hearing from them because they're thinking that, Oh, well it's not a crazy sign or anything like that. And that was very much me. Um, and so, you know, little things here and there really make me happy whenever I get an omen or whenever a specific animal related to a spirit I work with shows up or when I, you know, will sometimes I'll just go into my ritual room and I'll be like, guys, here's what's happening. Here's what I need. If y'all could come through, that'd be really, really great. Maybe shed a few tears, you know, uh, tell them how I'm feeling. And then like things like magically fall into place or like the right things happen at the right time. Like that to me is really beautiful um, beyond all of the sorcery and like the, the magic itself and the, the formulation in the business. I think that very much the, uh, the relationship I've cultivated with my spirits is what I like the most. That sounds lovely. It's a good time. We have a lot of fun here. (laughs) (laughs) Me and my 14 spirits. I am not there yet. Jag 14. (laughs) Oh, it used to be more. Uh, I used to joke around and be like, sometimes a home is you, your 14 spirits and your three cats. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. I maintain a lot of uh, different relationships on different levels with, different spirits but i mean like things incorporated very easily for me which is i'm very lucky about there's a lot of people that like will have a lot a spirit take over or you know uh multiple spirits that don't get along so they have to keep them separate or anything like that and i mean i've had a couple of things like that but generally speaking that sounds like um (laughs) yeah it's a lot of managing for sure yeah it's uh you're running a household a magical household on top of it um and so I was very lucky that everyone got along. Everyone was very nice. Mm. We're all good here. You know, we all have dinner. It's lovely. <laughs> What's something you did early on in your practice that you don't do anymore? And why don't you do it? Uh, casting a circle. Uh, I think that's like a big one. I think it's fallen out of favor in recent years from what I've seen. Back when I started, it was like, you got to cast a circle. Even if you're just pulling some cards, you have to cast a circle. You have to protect yourself, this and that. Um, And like, maybe like a year or two into my practice, I was like, this is tedious and annoying. And it does not do anything for me. Um, You know, so I stopped doing it. Uh, I think that a lot of the time if you're going to be doing ceremonial magic and you're going to be like delving into the keys of Solomon, whether you're doing just like greater key stuff and just conjuring or consecrating pentacles and conjuring angels and stuff like that. Um, or if you're doing like DSIC, like, of course I think the circles are very important, especially when they invoke certain names or grant specific um, presences that are necessary for the ritual. Um, you know, stuff like that, especially if you're going to be working with like more dangerous entities, they can be very helpful. Generally speaking, I'm very much, if you're going to do grimoire stuff, do it by the book, which includes the circles. Um, But if you're doing folk magic or if you're doing like witchcraft with a capital W and just like going into the woods and conjuring spirits, if you have the guidance and like the um, authority given to you by a spirit through initiation or through your relationship with them or anything like that, um... I don't think a circle is necessary, like very necessary because you're already going there with someone's authority. 
Um, I always talk about, you know, spirits standing at your back because you show up, but then all of your ancestors show up and all of your familiar spirits show up and all the gods and deities you work with show up and you call on them and it's, you welcome them into the ritual and into the space. And then it's you and an army of like thousands of ancestors and then a bunch of spirits that have dominion over other spirits. And then you're conjuring one or two little shades, you know? So I think I've gone to a point where I'm able to do that. Of course, like wear protection talismans, do all your protection stuff. Spirits can get crazy. Um, but in terms of like having a circle to convoke and to protect yourself against spirits when con- conjuring them, I don't think it's necessary. I actually, I don't practice traditional witchcraft, like with the capital T. Um, but I like the idea that they aren't necessarily doing it for protection. They're doing it to create a liminal space. I've done that before, but since I ward the property and I ask the the spirits that are already here to help me with that, I don't feel like I need to worry about it. Plus I don't do ceremonial magic. So that's how I do it. Yeah. No, the liminal space thing is definitely... I think it could definitely be a use for it, but also if you're practicing in your home and you're casting spells and creating wards and in relationship with spirits, you have spirits coming in and out all the time. You already are in a liminal space. I don't do that in my house. I do that out in the garden. (laughs) There's a specific Uh, place I do that. (laughs) Maybe that's a better idea than what I do. I don't have room in my house for more things. (laughs) Whether they're corporate or not, I just don't have room. There's stuff in here (laughs) taking up space. I can't always see it, but it's here. It's so real. (laughs) Every witch has themselves bending. Right. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) If we were in my studio, I literally have, you know, those wire shelves that you can like put up these strips on the wall and they hold. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Brackets, the, the wire shelving. Mm -hmm. full of er jars full of herbs and literally it bows in the middle and i need to install another thing Mm -hmm. in the middle to hold it up and i have not because it's a pain in the ass but (laughs) i've ruined every so bowed (laughs) (laughs) this used to be where it where my herbs were but it's only like literally this big and that's not enough Mm. now no so now i have an entire room (laughs) What's your favorite tool? It does not have to be a physical object. It can be in a, a philosophy or an idea, whatever. Why is it your favorite and how do you use it? I'm a big knife person. Um, very much. I have multiple blades that I use in my practice. Um, I work with them as spirits themselves. And um, I use them for everything. I mean... I love the, I don't know where I heard it, but there's someone out there, another podcast who was talking about blades and knives and stuff and was like, Wicca is all about, you know, you have an athame and you never use it. um, And it's just for ceremonial use and symbolism and all that. And traditional witchcraft is like, you need a knife. How are you going to cut things? You know, Uh, and I'm very much the second party. I use my knife for everything. I use my knife to carve candles, to collect plants, to protect my space, to banish spirits um to mix up certain oils that i do like if i'm doing like a protection oil or a cursing oil i will be stirring it with my knife um you know i go through multiple processes of honoring the spirit in it and blessing it um i'll anoint it with specific oils and then put it on the stove until it turns blue um which good steel usually you can do that with um because there's a belief that blue steel is good against spirits. Um, And then I'll feed it with oils and tinctures and smokes and all that and prayer before using it. Um, And yeah, honestly, if I'm leaving the house to do any sort of work, the knife is coming with me, even if I need it. If I don't need it, it's always on me. I 
I didn't think about that with the blue with the knife, but it makes sense with Haint Blue and the blue bottles and all the mm. other stuff that I see in Folk Magic. Mm-hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I first encountered it in um, like a thing on Japanese folklore. Um, cause they, they have like a whole blade smithing spiritual thing going on. Um, and that was a thing that was mentioned. One of my friends is half Japanese and she is sad that she doesn't speak Japanese or read it because she can only find Japanese literature about Japanese witchcraft and nothing that I mm. can read, for example. Yeah, unfortunately, that's why I'm I'm a big proponent of like learning as many languages as you can, because um, then you get to like you know delve into other sources and not be stuck in the North American English um, King echo James version of the Bible. Of, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like you're always hearing the same stuff, and everyone who speaks English, like the occult world, is so small um, that like. If you only speak one language, you're very much limiting yourself to the opinion of maybe like 10 to 25 experts on the topic. Um, And then you just got to wait until more stuff comes out or come up with your own stuff if you want to do anything. So speaking other languages really gets you into new ideas. Um, The same way that, you know, philosophy in other languages is usually illuminating. I bet. Can you pick out one decision you've made that changed the direction of your life? And if so, what was it? God, what did I do last week? Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, honestly, I'm a very, very uh, intense person in my decisions. I've made a lot of very, very... I don't have any issues making hard decisions. I make them very quickly because uh, I believe that any choice you make is the right choice. Um, as long as you make one. So, you know, I moved out on my own when I was very young, um, in part because I felt like I needed to for the magic stuff. Um, I started a business when I was very young at a very difficult time when I did not know anything about it. Um, that definitely changed my life. Um, you know, I have moved from province to province multiple times um, since being on my own and like all across the place. That's all. Everything changes your life. I don't know if there's anything uh, specific that I can pinpoint that really brought me to where I'm at now. But the business is a big one and the one that I'm very happy about every day. I'm very, very grateful that I chose to do this at the time that I did. Because originally I was going to do the business when I was like 31, 32, you know, all that um once i'm settled and have money and like know what i'm doing and all that but then that doesn't happen the pandemic happened you know i got my nice little curb payment from the government thank you canada um and then i invested all of that into the business and here we are cool that's nice i can't believe covid is like four years old Tell me about it. Holy shit. Jeez. Jeez. Speaking of which, how do you pull yourself out of a magical slump? <laughs> oh, back in the day, I think like things have changed lately because my slumps are different than they used to be. Um, Cause they used to be like, I had a slump and then I could kind of like stop doing magic and just like mind my business and then come back to it. Um, but now if I don't do magic, my bills don't get paid. So, (laughs) um, back in the day, I used to very much like delve into fantasy fiction and my like favorite comfort witchcraft movies and stuff like that, like practical magic and the craft and witches of Eastwick and, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, and then I would basically go armchair for a little while and just do a lot of research into folklore and beliefs and, reading like case studies and academic articles and stuff like that. Um, And then eventually something would happen that I was like, well, this is a good use for magic. We should probably do it. Um, I used to be very selective in like what I did magic for because I am a very independent person and I'm very much like, I can do it myself. I don't need intercession of anyone. Um, 
And so I would, I would like stubbornly just do things the mundane way, even though I knew that magic could help. Uh, whereas nowadays I'm like, oh, there's traffic on the road to the city that I'm going to. Might as well do a little road opener. Um, you know, so nowadays I'll usually do a big evil eye diagnostic, um, you know, do like a little egg limpia and see if there's anything on me. And then if there is, I'll get rid of that. I'll cleanse the house. I'll cleanse myself. I'll set up new protections and then I'll bless everything. Um, I'll refresh all my offerings to spirits. I'll also do like look into, did I miss an offering to a spirit that I owed and that I forgot about? And now they're mad at me and blocking my roads. Um, you know, anything like that. And then I'll make sure to do some divination to see if there's anyone throwing anything at me or essentially like reset myself spiritually and then do something that I really enjoy um, related to magic. That's not necessarily like casting a spell or anything like that, but a lot of the time I'll procrastinate um, crafting a spirit vessel or reorganizing an altar or I like making beautiful things. I'm like very artsy. And so sometimes I'll paint for a spirit or anything like that. And then that kind of gets me back on track um, and gets me back into the the saddle. I really like that idea. That had not occurred to me to make things for them. Yeah. Paint. Um, I do pottery. So I make like spirit vessels and bowls and stuff like that, that I dedicate to them or... You know, I love decor, so I reorganize an altar and buy new things for it. Um, painting, music, anything like that. Um, spirits love. Spirits love that kind of stuff. I think an offering of time is usually the best thing that you can do um, for a relationship with a spirit. Hmm. After Gem Show, I have things that I'm going to do now. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Are you going to uh, the Tucson Gem Show? Yeah, because I live in Tucson. (laughs) Oh, no way. That's amazing. Yeah. Be sure to check out. I have a bunch um, of friends. Yeah, Jeannie from um, Tides of Tea This is going to be there um, for the show, and she makes insanely beautiful um, talismanic jewelry. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a bunch of friends, uh, which friends are coming here. So I'm going to show them the shows I like to go to and show them the shows that are more suited to their business that I don't go to because it doesn't match mine. But I'm still excited to go to look at rocks <laughs> and eat <laughs> right. tacos. I love gem shows. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about the food. <laughs> so excited. <laughs> Can't wait. In the same way, there's um there's a food truck that parks outside of uh, like a rotating food truck that parks outside of the antique mall in Edmonton where I used to live, um and we used to go like antique shopping just to have food. Yes, <laughs> we'd walk around having like an ice cream float and being like, "Ooh, this bell is very old," and then just leave. <laughs> yeah, when I travel, I always look at the restaurants and pick them out. Oh, same. Mm-hmm. I do food tourism. Absolutely. Yes. My husband and I went on a trip from Colorado across the top of the U.S. I think we were on 70 and then down 95 and then back on 40 to hit all the big barbecue mm-hmm. cities in the you U.S. You like the square? Nice. Yeah. I oh, love I barbecue. Love that. <laughs> yeah. And no, Nashville hot chicken. I mean. The U.S. would be beautiful. Don't do it in summer if you have a dog with you. <laughs> so, say that. Oh, yeah. No, I know. It's too hot down there for my uh, my northern complexion. <laughs> <laughs> What's something you wish was discussed more in the witch community? Uh, scams and frauds and impersonators and also... I don't... What could I call it? Uh the right to one's ideas um being like a business in this sphere and also like when you blog for a long time um you're always bound to have people who will like rip off what you say or what you do and then sell it as their own or um a big thing that friends and I 
talk about a lot is um as people whose craft is often perceived as being more authentic in uh in air quotes uh or more like intense for the camera i guess um a lot of the time a lot of our concepts or philosophies or ideas or things that our spirits will have showed us or taught us will be co-opted by um people whose practices are a little on the uh, less spirit involved side of things um like that is a little bit more new agey and a little more approachable um because of course like they are incorporating the same ideas and concepts but then if they share it through their lens it kind of reduces our ideas down and down and down through the audience and trickles down to something that it's not um especially when it's something that's like spirit taught or you know or a methodology that you developed through mentorship and then you'll see people take easy bits of it and then reposting it for like beginner witch witch tips on TikTok and then that trickles down into just a mess, you know? So that can be very difficult um to see. It's a natural part of things. I think that's always going to happen. I do wish that there was a little more um openness about where you got ideas from or where you first encountered a concept or if you're going to be inspiring yourself heavily off of like a sigil design or a talisman design or um, a prayer or poetry or anything like that, especially because a lot of witches and occultists are artists. Um, I think there should be a lot more openness about referencing people and about working off of people's ideas and concepts. And then also having conversation with them because like, I am not go If I see, someone using basically the same sentences that I wrote in a blog article two weeks ago to sell their new product that they came out with without them ever speaking to me, I will be offended. If it's like someone Rude. who came into my inbox and was like, Hey, like, I really like what you're talking about. And like, I have these thoughts on it. And I thought that would be really applicable to my practice. And then we compare points and we have like a good conversation about it. Then like, I don't care what you do with it because I know where you're coming from. But if I don't know you, then it comes off a little, a little leechy. Discourteous. Um, How about just be courteous? Exactly. Exactly. I think that for a community <laughs> that recently online has been very vocal about building community and, you know, uh, supporting creators and stuff like that, there's a lot of um, PVP happening <laughs> um, in terms of co-opting ideas or spells or anything like that. Yes, I agree. Consider your three biggest influences, not necessarily people, just things that have influenced your practice, like philosophies, ideas, kind of like the tool question, except the three biggest influences on your practice. What would you thank them? Who are what who or what are they and what would how would you thank them? What are you thanking them for? Hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, I think for me, I consider myself an artist before I consider myself a witch. Um, and so in terms of influences, definitely um, medieval and early modern and Renaissance art um, and the themes that came through um, Baroque and Raphaelite art, um, and music and themes of religion as it intermingles with art and heresy and mysticism and just the, the lived experience of art through spirituality and spirituality through art, I think would be one. Um, and in terms of how I would think that one, I guess, I incorporate it into what I do as much as possible. Um, you know, making devotional art and always learning about things and educating myself constantly on the things that I'm passionate about and incorporating them into my practice beyond just being someone who admires it or someone who consumes it really try to take lessons from it and try 
to extrapolate um, meaning from the art with which I interact. And then another big influence would probably be my matrilineal line, like my mother and my grandmother and my step grandma and all that. Um, I come from a family of very strong, very, very um, wise women, but wise through experience. Um, I'm lucky that the women in my life are very handy and never let themselves kind of be strapped down by anyone's ideals or conceived notions of them. Um, very strong headed and very loud and opinionated and, um, successful and artistic and passionate, um, who were always very open-minded and very, very encouraging in everything that I did. Um, whether that's through art or through spirituality or through magic or, um, anything like that. Um, so that's definitely a big influence on me, especially because my mother literally was like, in this house, we pray to rocks. Here's how to pray to rocks. <laughs> it was, very, uh, it was like a very good guiding hand in those things. We had a little, a little back and forth when I first started doing magic where she was like, you're not going to burn 28 candles in my living room. Um, <laughs> and a lot of arguments and all that. <laughs> But apart from that, you know, um, I really appreciate the way that I was raised and all of that and given the tools to um, do what I do, especially because like my family is like we're all entrepreneurs. So I grew up in businesses and around business and I have like six fucking financial advisors that I can go to at all times and being like, how do I market this product? I have no idea. And everyone can help, which is amazing. Um, so yeah. And then magically, oof, I would say like the North American current of, um, folk magic. I don't talk about it too much because there's a whole conversation to be had of, um, nuance in collaboration, inspiration, appropriation, and all of the things regarding that. Um, but when I first started out, my uh my book of like cantrips is what i like to call it is um judica isles encyclopedia of 1000 spells which at the time i assumed was just like witchcraft um when in reality it is a book of hoodoo um you know it's very much based on southern american con- conjure southern american american like the united states um of conjure and hoodoo and practices that are very much based in the Bible belt and stuff like that. Um, and so I still carry a lot of that influence through to this day in terms of how I set up spells and how I work with plants and herbs. Um, and the language that I use, especially in terms of if we're talking about road opening, if we're talking about crown of success, um, fast luck like all of those things are things that originated in practices from the south of the united states um and so that's a very big influence that i like to honor and respect um yeah i would say those are the three i like those and i'm glad that i have new things to ponder for the rest of the week (laughs) what advice do you have for a new witch research just research um give up on Llewellyn and Weiser and Three Hands Press and all of the books the big witchcraft books that you're looking into those are fun to read those are really great once you've established a practice and once you have an idea of what they're talking about especially if we're talking about three hands press because god knows they have a thesaurus on deck um but you know scholar.google.com is a great place read academic articles um research folklore folk beliefs popular medicine um research witchcraft trials and research the politics of witchcraft throughout history not just in the modern days but also in the early modern era and um in iceland during you know the 
quote unquote burning times, which very strange subject. Um, you know, research your family's history as well and where you come from and your ancestry and their beliefs and their belief systems and how those things evolved through religion and with religion and against religion. Um, read up on philosophy of magic. Um, what, you know, there's a lot of our philosophy of magic comes from um, the Middle East and, you know, medieval texts um, from that era or from the Egyptians. And a lot of our astrology comes from the Mesopotamians and Babylonians um, and Egyptians. So research history and the evolution of magic um, and religion and spirituality and its effect on culture and anthropology through the years. Um, ethnographies are great to look into. All of those things. I think if you're going to be a witch, if you want to be the best witch you can be, you also have to be an academic a little bit. Um, the subject is so much more complicated and so much more complex than casting spells and getting what you want. Um, you're you're working within a legacy of beliefs and cultures and practices from the world over um, that were distilled into this very moment that allowed you to do those things. So always respect the people who came before you and the cultures things came from and make sure that your ideas are solid. That's the sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> Very passionate that about that. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that you've seen and answered these questions, um, who do you think would be interesting to also have answer these questions? Who should I invite on the show? Oh, that is a great question. Um, the folks over at the Frightful Hallows you may hear are very, very good friends of mine. And also very strong influences on my practice and just incredible people as well as incredible practitioners. Um, if you want to talk to scholars of magic, hit them up. They're incredible. And their their knowledge is honestly, I'm someone who talks a lot when I'm around them. I shut the hell up. <laughs> I just absorb. Um, they're very nice. Otherwise... Um... Sasha Ravitch is amazing as well in the astrology department and in the bridging of witchcraft and magic um, and astrology. Really like her work. I really like um, Manticore's Den as well, um, who practices um, some very interesting Thai things. Um, oh, God. Am I blanking on her name? Uh <laughs> Ivy.senna on Instagram um, is a good friend of mine as well. And she has been doing a lot of really, really amazing things with um, Pollux, the fixed star Pollux um, in Gemini. And she's also published a beautiful pamphlet through Hadean Press called Venus as Mother that I really enjoyed. Um, I think she would be super interesting to talk to, especially because um, if I'm not wrong, she is currently doing either a master's or a PhD in economics as a practicing witch. Um, and that's very, very interesting. Um, she's amazing to talk to. Uh, yeah, I think that's like my, that's, those are my big suggestions that I have coming to mind. I have to take a picture of what I wrote down because I always forget any race. It's dry erase. So I, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Compulsively erase it, so I have to take a picture. Honestly, um a throwaway notebook has like saved my life. I buy like the cheapest notebook I find and I just like write everything that I need in it and then it's changed everything for me. I can't I feel bad about throwing things away. <laughs> yeah, bitch is oh, a I hoarder. So <laughs> I still keep them, even if it's in the name. I have <laughs> so much stat. shit. There's so much shit. I can't. <laughs> uh, you know, I I'm have looking to, be able into, um, to remove it. Because like I'm like a big notes person and I'm always like taking like a hundred notes. 
um, and like making lists. And I like everything that I do, I like critique myself on. So like I write everything down. Um, but I was thinking of getting like a remarkable thingy thing. I don't, is, is it a tablet? I think I've I'm heard of sure. that. Um, but like, I like the idea that like you can write on it and like make PDFs and then just like upload them. Google yes. Drive and they're just there. Yes. So it's like a digital That's notebook that you can actually write in. I really badass. like um without it being like I have ADHD, so if you give me anything that has apps on it or anything else other than the thing that I need to get done, I'm not doing the thing. Um then you're so off like on then the, the, the game and Instagram and Facebook and everything else. Marco exactly. Polo. You know, running a business, you've always got something to check. Emails, yep. Instagram, Patreon, you know, everything. Yes. <laughs> Always a notification somewhere. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up or any questions that you had for me? Yeah. Um, well, I just released a collection for the Fixed Star Vega that I think um, I would love to kind of advertise and get out there a little bit more at the time of recording. I'm not sure when this is going up. Um, and yeah, if you guys are interested in what I do or if there is any questions that you have about anything that I said or if you'd like to book some spell work or divination anything like that um it's instagram.com slash kitchen toad you can email me also at m-a-h-i-g-a-x-n at outlook.com is my name with an x because it was taken um and yeah I'm also on patreon I do community rituals each and every single month for the Hawthorne tiers so if you guys are interested in that you can check that out um yeah that's about what i've got links will be in the show notes (laughs) make sure you check show notes either on spotify or apple or my website wherever they will be available so the last two things i ask of every guest thing number one recommend something to the listeners it does not have to be witchy Whatever you are super into right now, recommend something. I would recommend um, The Rules of Magic by Alice Hoffman. Uh, Just because I started listening to it again um, the other day as an audiobook. And it's honestly like Practical Magic is good. Rules of Magic is excellent. Um, If you want like a novel that's really... And like it really encapsulates, I think, the experience of being a witch in the modern age, even though like it's set in the 60s and stuff. But, you know, same old, same old Um, between the life upheavals and the troubles that magic bring into your life and, you know, doing things that you shouldn't. And also the complications of being queer in spaces that are difficult to exist within or um, love as a witch. um, And all those things and just magical realism. I think she really nailed it on the head. Um, I don't know if Miss Hoffman herself is a witch, but I think she really uh, got it right in um, the way that life often tends to happen to people on this path. Um, You're always going to be kind of uh, set apart and a little different from other people um, because of what you believe in and what you do and the lifestyle that you choose. And that leads to a lot of the adventures that the Owen siblings experience, in my experience. So, great book. Along that same line, I'm going to recommend my friend's podcast. I don't remember what the answer to the question was, but they interviewed Alice Hoffman on their podcast, the Magnolia Street podcast. I don't remember if she said yes or no, but they talked to her. So, check that out. (laughs) I will be listening to that later. (laughs) The last thing that I ask of guests is, please tell me a story. Ooh, what kind of story are you you in the market for? (laughs) Either something goofy that happened to you or something exciting that happened to you or just a story that you like to tell, whether it is folklore or whatever. Don't tell me Mm. some sort of, please don't tell me something from... A reality tv show <laughs> oh god so on last week's episode of the bachelor uh, <laughs> <laughs> on farmer wants a life <laughs> um, or i'm watching milf manor 
<laughs> because which bitch oh, amateur hour? Such a good one. Which bitch amateur hour is doing a special <laughs> series on them in their Patreon? I want to die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh God. Um, a story I like to tell. Hmm. This is when I realized that I don't tell many stories. Um, I can tell you the story about the first time that I, like, remember seeing a spirit very vividly and having, like, a very strange, like, ooh, experience. Yes. Um, so, to set the context, I used to live um, in a military base, uh, like a defunct military base. Uh, about, I'd say 25 minutes away from this town named Setsil, which is like the, the commercial metropolitan of Northern Quebec and with a, a booming population of 20,000 people at the time. Um, and so, you know, we lived in a very, it was very dark. Um, there was like no street lights or like anything like that, except for like one. And then there was like a big gate that led into the the base that was just like a residential neighborhood um, at that point. And so I think I was maybe seven, seven or eight, very young. And um, we were driving down. It was late. I think my mom had just picked me up from my sister's house because she was taking care of me for a bit. Um, We were driving home. I think it was probably like 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, and I'm half asleep. I'm in the back of the car, just like dozing off. And we are pulling up around this one bend. Um, and I just want to set the scene. Like there are no lights. We're on a single little dirt road. And there's pine trees that are probably like 20 feet high on both sides. There's, you can't see anything. Um, there wasn't even a moon in the sky. Like it was just so stupid dark. So it's headlights and a dirt road. And we're coming around this bend that's known to be very dangerous because there's the way that it was done was like you couldn't really see if another car was coming um, during the day. So lots of crashes and stuff like that. Just a very liminal, scary space. Um, And we're turning this bend. And then all of a sudden, I just like screech um, because I'm convinced that we're about to hit this man, like not a car, like a man that's like running across the road wearing this like not quite a cowboy hat, but like kind of a cowboy hat. Um, and this like fringe coat, um, like leather, brown tan leather coat. Um, and these baggy jeans. And he has like this big black beard. Um, and my mom like stops the car, like halts it. And we're like skidding a little bit. Um, and then we finally like stop. And then obviously she's freaking out. She's yelling at me. Um, but I, you know, I'm not listening whatsoever because there's a man at my window. Um, and so, (laughs) yeah, so there's like this man at the window and I, I'm obviously like kind of freaked out, but also I think that like a common experience when you see a spirit is that like, you're not afraid necessarily. You're kind of just confused. Even if like, if you think it's real, you would, you should be afraid, but like, you're kind of just like something feels off. So you're like, not sure how to feel. That's kind of how I remember feeling. Um, and this man like comes up to the window and like speaks to me. The window's closed by the way. Like there was no way I would have like heard anyone talk, but it was like clear as day. And I remember his face and I remember everything that he looked like. And I, my mom was like, what are you like looking at? What are you screaming at? And I described to her like this man who's at the window and what he's telling me, um and she starts crying and i'm like what the hell is going on um like even as a kid i was like what this is so weird um and then we just like drive off and we go home and like i a couple of days later i came to find out my mom was married um to a man named philip before i was born and he died um two years and a day before the day I was born. So she was widowed um, and he died from a heart attack in the woods. Um, Like he went out 
I think to check on traps or something like that. Um, cause we've always lived very rurally. Um, he was checking on traps or something like that. And he took the dog with him and he never came back. And then they essentially found him dead of a heart attack in the middle of the woods in the winter. Um, and the dog was just like barking and yelling and stuff. Very tragic. Um, but I didn't know any of that when that happened. Um, and then I, she like a couple of days later, like took out a photo and like showed me him. And it was like, exactly like that was him. Like I saw Philip. Um, and yeah, that's like a big story that like even she'll tell people. Um, and yeah, I mean, she's always said that like he looked over us and like stuck with us. Um, and like, we could see his shadows on the walls and like, look over, looking over us and stuff like that. Um, cause he was a very good man from what I hear. Um, and as I got into witchcraft and stuff like that, he's actually become a very integral part of my practice, um, as an ancestor that I work with. And so when I was getting into things, um, obviously like he was like, my mother is like, that was like the love of her life. Um, so she kept a bunch of stuff of his all the time, um, in this like trunk that she used to keep. And this one time I woke up from a dream where like Philip was essentially telling me like, go to this place in the closet, in this box, in this other box that's in it. And you're going to find this thing. And I did it and I found his knives that used to belong to him. Um, and then I, those are the knives that I use. Like when I said that, like my blades are very important to me, like that's why, um, I have two blades that were given from him, and then I have another that was selected by a spirit um, for a specific thing. But um, those carry him through in my practice. And I have like his old cigarette tin that he used to fill with rollies um, that I used to like put his offerings in. Um, and I light candles to him every November 28th, because um, that's the date that he passed. Um so that's like, yeah, that's like a big one that I always like telling people. Um, yeah. A good guy. We like him a lot over here. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I know I ramble a lot. So, Did you get in trouble for rummaging through her closet? <laughs> and then you have to no. say, yeah, but he said to. <laughs> Nah, I told, um, I told her what happened and she was like, cool with it. Um, my See, mom is that also would not very... fly at my house. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's a very, uh, spiritual person as well. She like, for as long as I remember, she's always paid attention to her dreams. Um, my mom has like the same dream every time someone's about to die around her. Um, and she it's like very accurate it's like kind of scary accurate and so it's happened multiple times where she's had the dream and then she'll like drive like 10 hours to the house of the person who she saw um and then like stay with them all day to make sure that no one gets hurt and they usually get hurt but at least they don't die um so you win some you lose some you know We're, uh, we're that a would stress me out so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotta go to Florida. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, everyone lives... Well, mostly everyone lives in Canada, so it's not too, too bad. We're all in eastern Canada somewhere. Oh, man. That would <laughs> stress me out. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, thankfully. It's been a while. But yeah, I could go on. Honestly, my family's got so much weird stuff happening. My sister's dad lives in her house and he's been dead for 20 years. You know, um, just things like that. Good old <laughs> rural folk tales. <laughs> well, thank you again for being on the show. And everybody be sure to go check out the show notes to get links to follow Mahigan on Instagram and everywhere else. And I'll see you over on Instagram. Bye. See ya. Mahegan, welcome to Hive House. Hello. Can you please tell me what your favorite quote is? 
Yeah. Um, so that is one of the questions that when I saw it on the list, um, I was a little anxious because I don't remember any like big quotes that um, I really Along refer with, to. Um, um, a few other friends but of one ours. came to mind. Um, and something that my grandma used to And say. we essentially had 10 days of partying and drinking and doing magic throughout the whole thing. Um, and so it was like every night it was like, you know, that meme of Lady Gaga who that's like bus, bus, club, flight, another club. It was that, but instead we were like tarot, uh, ritual, going into the woods, restaurant, drink. Um, and it was just like a crazy, crazy time. And we were all just cackling and laughing the whole time. We did not sleep, did not close the, like our eyes once. 